and it was also there in Mauritania that again I learned the value of curiosity um, and I was able to discover by, by listening to the local people and spending time with them that there were actually uh, crocodiles living on the edge of this desert that were supposed to be extinct um, and that was just an amazing thing. My name is Thea Darcott. I'm the Acting Executive Retail Editor and Events Director at Condé Nast Traveller. Some of you may be familiar with our live series of Traveller's Tales that we host mainly in London. While during this period of lockdown, we're extending those to recorded Zoom conversations, and we're very pleased you can join us. Today I'm joined by Dr. Tara Shine. Dr. Tara Schein is an expert in the field of climate change. She has advised world leaders, governments, multilateral agencies, and civil society organizations on climate change, environmental policy, and development assistance. Tara is co-founder and director of the award-winning social enterprise, Change by Degrees, and Tara's book, How to Save Your Planet, One Object at a Time, has just been published. So, uh, Dr. Tara Schein, could you start by telling me what inspired you to write this book? Oh, well, I've worked for many, many years, uh, 20 plus at the international level on environment, sustainability, climate change. And I've always seen the power in changing things from the top down. Um, but at some point, you know, people really, you know, weren't so interested quite often in that work that I was doing. So I'd be telling them I'm working on the Paris Agreement and they'd be asked, but what can I do? What's, it, what's important that I do? Do I have any power? Our agency and all of this um, and so really that was something that that really drove me to write this book which was something that is just hopefully accessible to absolutely everybody but that also helps to grow the conversation around what is sustainability um, so that more and more people can be part of this so this isn't something that just people ident that identify as being green do but rather that we all see the benefits in it for us so by writing about absolutely the most ordinary everyday objects that are in everybody's house garden shed gym bag I hope that this is something that's really accessible to everyone so I think especially with sustainability it's something that everyone is there's an increasing awareness about now um, and I think one of the problems that seems to be coming up is people are worried that they can't make enough of an impact so that you know it seems to be massively uphill struggle um, what are the can you give us a few simple things that we could do to help yeah so for example within the book the idea is that you find an object in there that kind of resonates with you or something that you use a lot or something connected to a habit that you have. Um, and you look at the suggestions and you try and make a change. So making the change is important, but that only changes you. So the really important thing to do is to make a change and tell others. So tell your husband, your wife, your sister, your brother, your friend, your colleague in work, what you've done and why it was quite felt good, why you feel like it's better for you for you too, not just for the planet, but also why it's better for you, why this habit is something you enjoy more, or maybe you're saving money, or um, it's getting you to get more exercise, this activity that you've, or habit that you've changed. So it's not just about making the change, I think it's also about talking about it and telling everybody. And do you think that there will be a point at which making small changes won't be enough anymore? How, how long, how wide do you think this window is that we've got to make a difference? So small changes on their own are not enough now. They're not, they weren't enough last year and they won't be enough uh, next year. Um, that's why it's important that we have a broader group of people that feel they are engaged in this conversation. So they're going to vote for and be supportive of governments taking systemic changes, making transformations to our society. So at the moment, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, we can see that when we have government taking strong action showing leadership making you know quite fundamental changes to the rules and regulations around how we live life accompanied by small changes or actually quite significant changes that we're all making in our own personal lives that completely changes the way that, that we do things and it needs to be done no different in the face of something like climate change or um, the biodiversity emergency we need to have both of those things and so no small changes on their offer are never, are never going to be enough that's why but many small changes by many people can help to create the right kind of environment or ecosystem for these big brave political changes to happen in. 
so with the lockdown i think that that maybe there is a slight silver lining for the environment with less planes flying and less carbon well carbon emissions going down and people spending more time at home and, and there's been a huge increase in interest in gardens and gardening do you think this is going to have a long lasting effect on on our approach to sustainability i certainly hope so i think you know some of it is the time we have in, in our gardens people who've never grown vegetables or perhaps seedlings before are doing that but i think we've also realized that for our mental health we really need the great outdoors um and you know there's lots of science behind that even 20 minutes in the outdoors every day improves your mental health and makes you a nicer person to be with so that's important as we're all stuck at home together but it's also important in a regular office context so you're a nicer work colleague if you're getting some fresh air and i hope that this means that we will look at how we design our cities and our towns and our villages in the future to make more use of our green areas to have more green areas um, and I know that for me anyway it's, it's this pleasure in, in our quiet more peaceful world to actually see nature getting a bit of a chance to express itself and for us to have the time to enjoy that and to realize how good it is for us too so I hope that's something we will absolutely hold on to and also invest more in um, post the post the pandemic post this crisis period and whilst we're on the subject of lockdown can we also um talk about toilet roll <laughs> <laughs> do you have any advice what can we do i mean whilst we're all busily hoarding it um what, what should we be thinking about when we make our selection so um we, a, we use a lot of toilet roll. So this is staggering. 57 sheets per person per day. I mean, I honestly don't think I use that much. I think people must have it round around, around, wound around their hand. I, I, I don't know what's going on with that. So, uh, you know, I don't think we need to have toilet paper police counting out the squares that you get, but possibly we could use less. Use less. And then being, when you're going to buy it, being a bit curious about um, what's in it. So buying some Buying toilet roll with, an, with even a component of recycled paper is a good idea. Um, an awful lot of the energy and resources used to make new paper can be saved. Up to 40% less energy has to go into making recycled paper. So reusing old paper that we've written on or printed on to make toilet roll sounds like a pretty good idea. And if you want an even simpler step than that, just make sure that all those toilet roll inserts in the bathroom bins don't go in the rubbish. Make sure they get recycled, then they can be turned into something else. Do you have any tips for recycling them? What should we be doing whilst we're at home with our... So the, the big, well, yeah, so if it's about re recycling it, number one, it's most people's bathroom bins never get anywhere near being segregated out into their recycling bin, their rubbish bin, their compost bin. Um, so that would be number one. Don't forget the bathroom bins. You know, they also have like hard plastic shampoo bottles that are empty, rinse those out, recycle those. Um, we've been having great fun in our house because the when the pandemic hit, we hadn't got time to kind of get supplies in for growing things in the garden. So I have toilet roll inserts all filled with seeds, which now are baby courgette plants that are ready to be planted out in the garden. And they were, they were perfect. And you didn't need to do anything, just literally fill them with compost. I haven't you know, even folded in the bottoms of them. And then because the, the, the paper is um, compostable and biodegradable, I can literally just put them straight out into the garden. So a whole new use for toilet roll inserts. Fabulous, fabulous news. Um, and I wanted to talk about your passion for nature because it is infectious and the, and, and the planet. Where, when did it start? Oh, as a kid, I think no different to anybody else, you know, enjoying time in the outdoors. My mum says I used to have competitions with a boy next door around who had the bigger earthworms living in their garden. Um, I, I certainly always enjoy being outside and had a curiosity about that. I, I think I got some of it definitely from my parents. My father was a geography teacher, so he took us on these endless, you know, weekend drives looking for drumlins and curry lakes. So obviously some of that, um, you know, had an impact on me. But then in secondary school, I started up a, a green team in the school. It was the first time we had a green team. Um, so it's always been there, I think. And I, I'm just curious, as is any scientist, curiosity is a wonderful uh thing to have and if you if you wonder about how something works and why it works that way for me my curiosity is all about the natural world and how it provides for us as human beings and other species and and how we all live together and can how can we more harmoniously live together because we're just one one creature one species in the whole tapestry of what lives on planet earth and can you tell us about your trip to antarctica which sounded absolutely incredible 
it was. I went to Antarctica uh, last year on a ship with 90 women. My husband said that sounded like the most horrific thing he could think of. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed myself. It was part of a leadership program for women in STEM. So I was with 90 women scientists, not all interested, not all from like climate or environment backgrounds. We had medical doctors, we had uh, people who worked with uh, bioscience that worked with physics, um oh gosh any any stream of science you can think of they were all represented there and we were we were there to to learn from this amazing continent um we're, we're all really passionate about um being ambassadors for antarctica and for our natural world and for using our leadership to help find solutions to things like climate change and what we were doing on that ship was building those leadership skills those visibility skills our communication skills um, and now i'm part of this amazing network of already 500 women who have all been through this program and we we work together we collaborate together we amplify each other's voices um, and i was supposed to be going back to antarctica in november as a as a leader as a member of faculty this time uh, but that's on hold for the moment but uh, it will still happen yep I'm sure it will. And you've got to hang out with some humpback whales, I believe. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm lucky where I live in Ireland. We have lots of cetaceans, so lots of uh, whales and dolphins in our coastal waters. But I had never had a chance to come up close and personal with a humpback whale. And that happened while in Antarctica in a very small blow up with Zodiac boat. And uh, oh, for me, it was one of those breath holding moments where two humpback whales came came to the surface to breathe right beside our, our tiny little boat and it's that it's that being so close with hearing their out breath you know through their blowhole um and then as they just tip down under the water and the huge fluke goes up in front of you and they effort at least effortlessly glide back into the water i mean it just all of these things are important i think in reminding us that we we're only small as human beings. We think we're so powerful. We think we can master nature. We think we can master a virus. We think we're um, so much more powerful than we are. We are but a small cog in the wheel, one that's having an amazing impact, right enough, for good and for bad on every other species on the earth, mostly bad at the moment, unfortunately. Um, but I think it's, it's always immensely powerful to be reminded of uh, our place in the world and, and a, an upfront encounter like that with a humpback whale does that. And you've been to some amazing places with your research and also to, to increase awareness of them. What, what has been the most amazing experience for you? Mm. You have a special one. Well, when I was quite a lot younger, I lived for almost three years in Mauritania um, in West Africa. Have you ever heard of Mauritania? I'm afraid I haven't. <laughs> no, so it, it's, it's a huge country. It's two and a half times the size of France and it's between Morocco and Senegal. So a huge country, but three quarters of it is the Sahara Desert, um, and it's an Islamic country. So when I was uh, in my in my mid twenties, I went to live there for three years. So uh, an Irish girl in an Islamic country, having to work through French and Arabic, um, it was one of the most challenging things I ever did. It gets to fifty degrees um, in May. It's like having a hot hair dryer blow at you all day long really really tough conditions and and then amazingly resilient proud people that live there that found a way to to live in quite often mobile moving around after their their animals their camels their sheep and their goats looking for pasture but i learned so much from those people and it was also there in mauritania that again i learned the value of curiosity um, and I was able to discover by, by listening to the local people and spending time with them that there were actually uh, crocodiles living on the edge of this desert that were supposed to be extinct. Um, and that was just an amazing thing um, and ended up being, you know, an important scientific discovery, but discovered purely by the fact that I was lucky enough to live there and had curiosity about what people were telling me and the stories they were telling me late at night over cups of tea but that was an amazing place to live um, at an amazing time uh, in just a completely different way of life to to our life here in, in the uk or ireland but, um, but i'm lucky I've, as you say i've traveled all over the world i have a great love for mongolia as well i think i like these vast open countries with um, nomadic people that are that are so strong and so proud and so much fun um, I'm definitely drawn to those as well as anywhere where I can go swimming or scuba diving that would be uh, another another uh, key attraction for me 
So before we get onto your passion for water, I just wanted to ask you, how many languages do you speak? Uh, I speak several badly. So uh, English, obviously, uh, Irish, our native tongue in Ireland, badly. Um, I learned uh, French, and Sp French and Spanish, um, Arabic, this one dialect that they speak in Mauritania. Uh, I could speak that, but I lose, you know, all languages, you lose them over time. I learned um, Bahasa Indonesia before I did a BBC expedition there um, uh, to Borneo. That was uh, oh, maybe 12 or so years ago. Um, and I learned a little bit of German at one point as well. So yeah, I tend to pick up languages as I need them and then, and then forget them. <laughs> I, mean, I think that's admirable. I, and I think it must make a big difference to your experience of a country as well, if you can communicate. And for, for example, with the crocodiles, actually find out because you're listening to stories over tea late at night with the locals. Yeah, and for me, like if you take Mauritania again as, a, as an example, because I learned how to speak the local language, I was able to speak to the women. So A, I was able to speak to women because I was a woman, um, and so many of people who would have gone before me in the type of job I would have been doing would have been men. Um, so I was able to, I was, because I was a, a foreign woman, I was, I was granted meetings with the men, but then I could also go out the back and have conversations in the local language with the women and get their side of the story. So um, speaking a local language is a great way to get proper insights into any country. And people are so generous. Like even if you make a mess of it, if you're at least trying, they, they'll try back with you. And now on to water. I know you're incredibly passionate about the sea. Have you been able to go swimming recently? I have. I'm so lucky. Um, in, in Ireland, in the lockdown, we were restricted to a two kilometre radius from our homes for um, exercise. And within two kilometres, I can get to the sea and go for a swim. So I feel blessed. I have a lot of swimming friends who haven't been in the water now for six weeks or more, and they're going crazy. Um, the people doing all kinds of things like putting up paddling pools in their back gardens and swimming in streams and everything just to get a swim. So no, I have been, I have been swimming. And then um, I am quite a softy uh, and in the, you know, in the, I love my wetsuit, but my wetsuit ripped. So I've actually had to go in my togs and get tough. Um, and the water's still quite cold. It's about nine, 10 degrees. So uh, I found in the COVID pandemic that I can be a bit tougher than I ever thought I could be. So that's a good thing. New strengths. <laughs> yeah, um, new strengths. What is it about the sea that, that you love so much about when you're swimming in it? Oh, there's something about the moment you stick your head under the water, it just washes all of your stresses and worries away. It, I don't know. It must be the ultimate kind of reconnection with nature to just immerse yourself in it in that way. Again, you have this, this realization that, that you're small, the sea is big. You know, you, there's a great respect in sea swimming in that you know that you have to be careful. The ocean is so much more powerful than you. A tide, a current, a wave, all of those things. Um, are to be respected and, and I think you know so I enjoy that and then I enjoy the swims that we do the different perspective you get of of the world around you as well you're watching it from a different place and it's from a different level your view of seabirds your view up a cliff your, your view all of that is so different it's, it's fantastic um yeah and I never but feel re-energized at the end of a swim so when this is all over, what, what are your plans? What have you got planned next? Obviously Antarctica might be on hold. Is there anything else we have to look forward to? Well, there's, because the book has been published, I hope at some point that I will be getting to do all those fun book tours and book festivals that were, that were planned. Um, so many people have had to put those on, on hold, but I know, I know they'll come back in a different way. And the thing that I'm most excited about is how we might, really shape a new normal um that we won't go back to things exactly as they were i don't want it to be just the same i want us to improve things and learn lessons from this time so i want to be not as bonkersly busy um i want people not to have to jump on planes so much for work or spend so long commuting i want people to have more time to spend in the great outdoors um, so i what one of the things i'm working really hard at now is to try and make sure that we through our economic policies, through what businesses do, through how communities restructure themselves, that we create a better normal than the one we had before. Well, I think that's very, very perfectly optimistic from you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tara Shine. Thank you. It's been so lovely talking to you. <laughs> and to you.